Alrighty, we'll get started here as, uh, as the participants slowly filter in. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Supporting Wild Bees. My name is Thomas Harrington, and I'm the Agri-Environmental Specialist with Perennia Food and Agriculture. It is my privilege to welcome you to today's webinar, and I want to thank you all for taking the time to join us here today. With that, let's get started. We will begin with just a few Zoom housekeeping items. All participants will have their audio and video turned off to prevent background noise during the webinar. You're encouraged to ask questions, so please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. These will be monitored during the presentation by our team members and verbally asked. You can also use the chat function, and this will be visible to all participants to comment and respond. Before we begin, I would like to give a brief introduction to the new Nova Scotia Agri-Environmental Program, or AEP. The Agri-Environmental Program is a partnership between the Nova Scotia Federation of Agriculture, the Nova Scotia Department of Agriculture, and Perennia Food and Agriculture. This program combines environmental components from each of these organizations building on their individual strengths. The AEP provides comprehensive and relevant information to help reduce environmental risk on farm increase public trust and expand market access. The program is funded through the Canadian Agricultural Partnership, which is part of a commitment by federal, provincial and territorial governments to promote productivity and profitability for the agriculture sector. Please learn more about this program by going to the new website at nsaep.ca. This webinar is an initiative of the new Nova Scotia Ag Environmental Program that aims to provide new and relevant agri-environmental information to the industry. I would also like to acknowledge my agri-environmental program colleagues from Environmental Farm Plan, Trevor Davison and Corey Roberts, who helped to facilitate today's webinar. Environmental Farm Plan has worked with the Clean Annapolis River Project on a number of initiatives, including the Species at Risk Partnership on Agricultural Land Programs and other biodiversity enhancing projects. I'm pleased to have joining me today as co-host of this webinar, Brittany Scott, Private Land Stewardship Coordinator with the Clean Annapolis River Project. She will be helping to introduce the project, uh, introduce the topic, our guest speaker, and facilitate the Q&A session. Brittany, I will now pass it over to you. Awesome, thanks for that, Thomas. Um, so as you said, my name is Brittany Scott and I work for the Clean Annapolis River Project. Uh, and it's my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Nancy McLean. So Dr. Nancy McLean is an assistant professor at Dalhousie University in the Faculty of Agriculture. She teaches courses in genetics, cropping systems, and plant breeding. She's also assistant dean students. She studied at the Nova Scotia Agricultural College, which is now the Dalhousie Agricultural Campus. She also studied at McGill University and Dalhousie University. Her current research includes two areas, the first being plant pollinator interactions and the second being silage quality. She currently lives in Pictou County, Nova Scotia on a dairy farm managed by her husband and her son. Um, with that, I'll let you take it away, Dr. McLean. Thank you, Brittany and Thomas. Now we'll see if we can share a screen again. <laughs> Yay! Thanks too. It's <laughs> great. <laughs> Got this far. That's a real accomplishment. Um, so the topic today is supporting wild bees. And I have to say, this is my very first webinar. Uh, that might not be a surprise for Thomas and Brittany. And um, this is a picture actually of uh, Alex Krause's front yard. And um, it's, it's, it's actually supporting wild bees as well as, as his own honeybees. Now, okay, a little bit of background um, for flowering plants. So a little bit as, a, as an instructor, professor, I can't help it. But flowering plants have been around for a very long time. I'm a plant scientist. A great appreciation for plants. The trend over time, though, as plants evolved, was for flowers to get bigger and then to have uh, more pollen and nectar, also to become more colorful and more frag fragrant. And that was related um, to the co evolution with pollinators. If flowers were more attractive to pollinators, then they produced more seeds and that, that gave them a genetic selective advantage. 
bees are not the only pollinators uh, for flowering plants. There are others, but bees are the, the animal group that is by far the most important at pollinating flowering plants. Bees mostly carry the pollen on their legs or their bodies. Uh, they have branched hairs which carry the pollen. There's one group of bees that carries pollen in their stomachs with the nectar, it's Polydidae, I believe. You might be surprised to find out that less than 1% of the pollen that plants produce is actually used for pollination. The rest of it is for food um, used by the pollinators. So the pollen that is used for pollination is just the pollen that the bees are unable to groom from their, from their bodies. Um, and then bees also carry nectar within their stomachs. So bees can survive, they do survive completely. They get all their nutritional requirements from a combination of pollen and nectar. And they're the only animals that will do that. Most bees uh, nest in the ground in sandy well-drained soils. Um, about 10 to 20% of bees are cavity nesters. So most live uh, in or produce their nests in the soil, but some of them will actually produce nests in um, trees or stems or in dead woody material. Most bees are also generalist pollinators. Um, it means that the species does not survive solely on one plant species. Most bees are also solitary, although we think about the bees that are not solitary, which are honeybees. Honeybees and bumblebees are social, but most other bee species are um, solitary. They live on their own. So in those species, all females are queens. There are no workers. The queens have to um, have the babies and do all the work themselves. Um, and I believe there are about 3,500 bee species in North America. So there's a, a diverse um, group of bees in the world, but even in North America. Some bees are capable of buzz pollination. They use their wing muscles to produce vibrations and that will um, bring about pollination more quickly. We'll release pollen from anthers and some, about 6% of flowering species have uh, pollen inside anthers that have pores. So the anthers have to be actually vibrated in order for pollen to be released, to be available for pollination or for bees. One example is blueberry flowers. So blueberry flowers hold their pollen inside anthers. They need to be shaken so that the pollen can be released from pores little openings in the anthers. And honeybees are not able to buzz pollinate, um, which puts them at a huge disadvantage for pollinating something like blueberries. But frankly, a bee that can buzz pollinate is more efficient at pollinating anything than bees that are not able to, to buzz pollinate. I think uh, it takes about seven honeybees to do the work of one bumblebee or one buzz pollinator. Um, partly because of that. So buzz pollinators uh, locally are bumblebees and andrenids, uh, which are smaller black bees. What do bees need for nutrition? I've already told you. Sounds like a test question. Pollen. Pollen uh, is mainly to provide protein for developing larvae. Uh, there's also some lipids, vitamins, and minerals in pollen, but it's primor primarily a protein source, whereas the nectar uh, is an energy source. It's mainly sugars, although there are a few other um, components, amino acids, salts, and secondary metabolites. And nectar is believed to have antibiotic properties due to presence of secondary metabolites. Um, what else do I want to tell you about here? Hmm. Um, when you think about uh, bees laying eggs, when they lay their egg, eggs, what they put with the egg is a mixture of pollen and nectar, and that's often sufficient food to go from an egg stage to an adult. So it's kind of like if you have a baby and then you put it in a box with a bunch of food and then you open the box 18 years later, and you've got a fully developed, <laughs> it's kind of like that. 
they really shouldn't be talking about that. Um, but it's kind of the same idea. So give them all that they need and then let them be on their own till they're grown up. I'm a plant scientist. So why the heck am I talking about bees? And why do I have a research program on bees? I'm blaming it first on clover. So I did my PhD on red clover, a genetic study. And um, just red clover in the picture here, but I did a lot of crossing, pollinating red clover by hand using toothpicks with little bits of sandpaper glued onto them. That was fun craft activity. Um, but when it came time to produce larger quantities of seeds, I thought I can't do this all with toothpicks. So why not use bees? I tried some leaf cutter bees, but I wasn't, wasn't thrilled. So I, what I saw outside in the fields was bumblebees pollinating red clover. So I, and I knew that red clover has a very long corolla tube or flower tube. So it's uh, about a centimeter from the tip of the flower to the base where the nectar, the sweet nectar is found. So be, bees need long tongues, tongues that will roll out to about a centimeter long to reach the nectar. If they can't reach the nectar, then they're not usually interested in the flowers. So I looked around and I found Chris Plowright had developed um, techniques for rearing bumblebees from queens that he collected in the spring. So I somehow convinced him to train me in how to raise colonies of bumblebees from single queens that I, I collected in the spring. So in the spring, the bumblebees you see are really big, big fuzzy bees. And that's because they're queens that have overwintered. They were bred the previous um, late summer. Then after they're bred, they burrow into the soil and then they emerge in the spring when it's warm and they fly around looking for a place to lay a nest. To, they're ideally looking for a rodent nest to, to occupy and um, they will lay all of their eggs in that nest once they find it. Most queen bees are not successful. They never find a nest or they find a nest and another queen comes in and stings them to death and takes it over. So most queens are not successful. Um, but if you can find, so I would be outside in the spring looking for bees flying low to the ground. And um, if they hadn't already started collecting pollen, I knew they hadn't already nested. So I would collect those types of queens and then raise them in boxes and feed them, look after them. Anyway, that got me into bees, kind of, kind of heavy into bees. And the next blame is on Robin McCollum. Robin McCollum was an undergraduate student who had been doing some research in the summer in New Brunswick in Blueberry Country, the Acadian Peninsula. And she did um, two years of research um, looking at flowers um, in fields that bordered blueberry fields. So she's looking for flowers and for bees that actually visited those flowers. So the idea was, what flowers do the bees use after the blueberries have finished blooming? So bumblebees are good pollinators of blueberries. We know that, but blueberries only bloom until late June. So what, do the, what can the bees survive on after that? So she was trying to, to find out and she published her, her fourth year pro project. I'm just going to present a table that it's actually part of a table from, from Robin's paper. And she looked at the duration of bloom of different plants and also looked at how frequently they were visited by different species of bumblebees in this case. And the winner in terms of providing the longest days of flowering was red clover. And it probably would have gone further, but Robin had to come back to Nova Scotia to go to school. So the project ended before she started um, back to school in September. So red clover was the longest followed by vetch and then alfalfa. The thing about these first three species is they are all perennial forage legumes. And I've spent, from my undergraduate project all the way through, I've worked with forage legumes. Um, 
these, I love legumes, uh, especially perennial forages. They add uh, nitrogen to the soil, so you don't need to fertilize them with any nitrogen fertilizer. They produce high quality feed for animals. And they also provide high quality pollen for bees. Um, there's a, the fourth one on that list is also a legume, a sweet clover, although it's not perennial, it's a biennial. And then there's a few other species rounding out there, fireweed, goldenrod, um, people who have blueberries know that those are good sources for bees late in the season. And wild rose was the, I did the top eight here, I guess. And the rose family is also known to produce high quality pollen. Not all plants produce high quality pollen for bees, Generally, if a plant does not need to be pollinated by bees, it doesn't put energy into producing high quality pollen. So um, plants that require pollination by bees generally have evolved so that they're, they provide exactly what bees need. Robin stuck around for a while. So <laughs> she's now Dr. Robin. Um, so her, she's, she stayed at Dalhousie Agricultural Campus to do a, a PhD project after her undergraduate training. And uh, her project dealt with bees and um, supporting them and bees and blueberry production. And part of the project um, that fell under her thesis, uh, partially anyway, was development of a pollinator mix. Um, so we did a tr we did project multi year project multi um, site replicated trials of different flowering species trying to find what's a good mix for bees what plants can what seeds can we plant that will produce good food for bees and this project was partially funded by Syngenta and Syngenta had a operation pollinator project and they actually had developed a mix and we evaluated their mix. But I thought it was not very good. <laughs> so they were funding it, but I, I didn't like their mix. So the project, the, the treatments that were included in the study were elk site clover, bird's foot trefoil, buckwheat, which is something that um, Robin has done more work on as well, crimson clover, phacelia, red clover, yellow sweet clover, and three different commercial bee mixes. So we included Syngenta, also a Vesey bee mix and a Halifax seed uh, bee mix. Problem with the, poly the commercial bee mixes, they were extremely expensive. They have so-called wildflowers. They're not agricultural crops, so they, they're difficult to establish, frankly. So we had a lot of weeds growing, for good or bad. Um, and not really a whole lot of flowers for the bees. And the other thing was that the flower quality in terms of pollen and nectar were not as high as with the, the 4-H legumes. Um, so what I ended up with as a pollinator mix is on the slide here. And Syngenta subsequently contracted spear seeds to produce lots of this mix. And Syngenta actually gave it away to, to farmers across Canada. In Eastern Canada, it was mainly for blueberry production, but they also distributed it in Central and Western Canada for other purposes. The nice thing about this mix is I think of it, I've done some cover crop research, and I think of this not just as a pollinator mix, but as a cover crop mix. So you might notice Timothy is in the pollinator mix, which is weird because it's a grass and grass is are wind pollinated, they don't need bees. So Timothy's not produce, providing food for bees, but it is providing stability to the soil. So grasses like Timothy have fibrous root systems to hold the soil in place, prevent erosion. So this could be planted around the um, outsides of, of fields, including potato fields and other crops. Timothy also is a bunch grass and it can provide habitat for beneficial ground beetles, which is another kind of passion. So there are multiple benefits to this mix besides just feeding bees. And um, I know Cavendish Farms has grown this mix around in demonstration plots in PEI, 
show producers. And I believe the PEI Potato Marketing Board is uh, doing research this coming year uh, with uh, this mix or a very similar mix based on this mix um, to provide, to help with pollinators, but also reduce erosion in PEI. Um, and it's, sorry, it also is much better. The Timothy also helps with weed control. So it will um, compete with weeds very well. Um, doesn't need any nitrogen and it's uh, a relatively inexpensive seed mix. Phacelia is a species you might not be familiar with. It is known as a cover crop, but it's a bee magnet. It will grow and flower very quickly. It's an annual, so it comes out that first year, grows, produces, a beautiful blue field just covered in all kinds of bees um, and then it dies because it's an annual but it does it's really good for establishment. Okay bring in Becca. Rebecca Aberly Ryan uh, did an honors project with me in 2019 and it was really based on assessing that mix and we uh, evaluated she and I it was an unfunded project we drove to the valley every every two weeks in 2019. We had hoped to do it in 2020. That didn't happen, or I had. Um, and we visited three farms. There were three actually honeybee yards. Um, one had been planted that year to the mix. That was Angus L's for Bragg lumber in, um, in the valley. Alex Krause's was in its second year of production. Um, and Kevin Spicer was in the third year. So Kevin had gotten some of that free seed um, from, I think, a Truro Agrimart, Syngenta had supplied it to them, so Kevin had uh, got some early on. And uh, a bunch of grass, but it's just, it's not a hard story here, I don't think. So year one, year one was a really tough year. So 2019 spring was cold and wet. Uh, Angus was in a hurry to get this in the field, but the it had been a cornfield. It was plotty, and then it got really dry, so horrible conditions for seeding. I didn't think anything would grow, um, but by August 2nd, my sister's birthday, um, we were able to get enough flowers to collect some data for density, and Phacelia, as expected, took off. Densities are not great. I'm not impressed with these numbers, but at least something was growing, and frankly, Angus uh, sent me a couple of pictures in summer 2020 and the field looked fantastic. I couldn't believe it. Anyway, but this was the starting year. So Phacelia grew so a little bit of birds with tree foil, some alcite clover and red clover. This is showing that same data, but it's in a different format. So the top line is the flower community. Blue is Phacelia. So most of the flowers were Phacelia and followed by red clover, a little bit of alcyc in pink and a little bit of trefoil in green. But then comparing the composition of the field with what the bees were actually visiting, um, the bumblebees were visiting, uh, they, all that we viewed them on were the phacelia and the red clover. But if you look, the honeybees were less likely to be on the red clover than the bumblebees. And that's because honeybees have shorter tongues, so they'd prefer the more open phacelia flowers. And this is what it looked like. So you can see some little yellow flowers, trefoil, the blue is the phacelia, and I can see some leaves of sweet clover, which won't bloom until the following year. It's a biennial, and I can see some red clover and alcyc leaves there too. Then to Alex's, the second year of the mix, uh, we evaluated these all in the same days, but they were planted. The planting was in different years. So for Alex's, uh, lots of alcite clover, the pink, lots of red clover, and then behind that some sweet clover, and then um, lower amounts of others. So primarily alcite and red clover and sweet clover. And then there were more bees at Alex's. This was his front yard that was planted to the mix. It's a big front yard. Um, but the top line again is the flower community and the rows below it are the different groups of bees. The line that looks the most different is the one that's mostly red, that's bumblebees again. So bumblebees preferring the red clover, bigger reward, they've got a bigger tongue, they can reach the bottom. And then the other bees were more likely to be on alcite clover, which is a shorter, smaller flower, more accessible for them. 
And this is what his front yard looked like. And close up showing alcite clover, which is pink, and then um, some red clover flowers there in this close up picture. Then later in the season at Alex's, um, it was almost all red clover present. So that's going back to that Robin's undergraduate project, which showed the longest duration of flower, which flowering was from red clover. So late in the season, the bumblebees and honeybees are still out there. Um, some of the smaller bees are, they're out of season. So they have shorter, um, shorter seasons. So they're already done their, their life cycle by late in August um, when the bigger flowers are around too. And this is what it looked like uh, August 16th. So this is regrowth. So this was a portion of the field. I told Alex and Kevin to mow half of their fields in early July or late June so that you would have a continu continual flush of flowers so that it didn't all get all brown and dead flower heads. So this is regrowth. Your three Kevin Spicers, uh, lots of red clover, the biggest peak there and the most broad again, and the alcite following that. Um, Birds with trefoil, uh, it's with trefoil and sweet clover are about the same pattern. There's a turquoise and a purple there, some white clover that grew on its own. Um, and then wild carrot was coming in. And again, uh, different bees, bumblebees sticking out here the top lines, what flowers were there by proportions, and then what were different bees uh, observed on. So bumblebees, mainly red clover, honeybees, uh, the highest percentage was on alcite clover. There's a, a honeybee on bird squid trefoil, nice picture, and some red clover beside it. Uh, this is late in the season again. So for Kevin Spicer's the year three, um, lots of red clover still, but what's coming in here is uh, Trifolium hybridum. I believe that's uh, alcite clover. And same thing, bumblebees mainly on red clover, honeybees mainly on uh, alcite clover. And just to let you know that we weren't just feeding bees, we were feeding, there were other insects, there were hoverflies and butterflies and moths, there um, some beetles on flowers too. So we weren't just feeding bees, we were feeding all kinds of other, other insects as well. Okay, jumping to Catherine Rutherford. Catherine is a current PhD student working with me and again, working in plant pollinator interactions in wild blueberry agro ecosystems, trying to determine how to best support the pollinators um, so to try and actually try and take advantage of the free pollination services from the wild bees. Uh, blueberry producers spend lots of money on bringing in hives, bringing in um, mostly honeybee hives. Some bring in bumblebee hives, but there's all kinds of wild bees around. And some of our research has shown that in some fields, there are more wild bees than honeybees, even when there are hives present and the wild bees are doing more work per bee than the honeybees. Uh, this is my least favorite slide, I'm sorry. I can't kill a bee. So this one is really bothering me, um, but I left it anyway. Uh, so <laughs> we sacrificed, well, I didn't, but my team sacrificed some bees. Uh, Catherine is a molecular biologist, molecular geneticist. And we were sitting around one day thinking about possible projects for her PhD. And she knew I was working on bees. So we thought it's really hard to get, to observe everything that a bee, everything that bees are doing in a field. What if we could um, extract the pollen from a bee's body and identify what plant species it was carrying? So that's what we did actually, and it turned out to be, Catherine was very good at it. So in addition to all the observations we took, uh, a subset of bees were collected and sacrificed and um, subjected to, or the pollen was collected from their bodies and subjected to um, metabarcoding so that we could identify what different species were present. We also identified the bees by barcoding that uh, 
just just to just to verify that we had the the correct bees with the correct um, pollen. I'm only showing a, a, a small um, portion of Catherine's um, updates. Um, this first one is interesting. So it's showing the different families of bees and it's showing the graph is based on how many plant species were found on individual bees. So the very first, the tallest column there represents the bees who were carrying one single plant species of pollen. So the bee, different bees within a species would carry different plants, but often an individual bee carried only one plant species of pollen. And then it drops, so the second column is uh, bees, uh, accounts for the bees that carried two different plant species. And then I think up to, it might be 13 was the maximum number of plant species that a bee was carrying in its pollen. And you can see the different families of bees. Uh, Andrena day, Apy day, Apy day includes, we did not collect any honey bees. So we were only collecting wild bees and the Apy days here are mainly um, uh, bumblebees and uh, uh, um, Milosoides, Milosoides. Um, there's sweat bees, the Helictidae, Megacalidae includes the leaf cutters. Anyway, you can ask me more, I guess. And then the common plant taxa in the loads. So during blueberry bloom, there's worry that blueberries really have crappy pollen. Um, it's low percent uh, protein and it's hard to get at. So it's not great. So there's, even when I went to school, we were told that um, if you bring, bring hives into blueberry fields, don't let them eat any, don't uh, let them see any other plants because they won't want to go to the blueberries. But anyway, we found that's not really true, that 96% of the bees during blueberry bloom that were found in the fields were carrying blueberry, only blueberry, which was surprising. Um, and then after that, it went down to Rose family, again, great family, that would have been mostly um, uh, uh, cherries, pin cherries and choke cherries, probably for the prunus. Then some maples, rumex, probably um, sheep sorrel, uh, some bucus, elderberry, terrasicans, dandelions, rhodora, hawkweed, uh, mountain ash and willows. So, but primarily um, it's blueberry, which is good news for blueberry producers. In the summer, it changed because the blueberries were mostly no longer flowering. There are a few blueberries down at the bottom of this list, um, but mostly goldenrods and then trifolium, which is clovers and vetch vichia, and lotus, birds with trefoil. So the uh, perennial legumes were there too. And finally in the fall, mostly asters because that's mostly what's blooming. There's a few leftover blueberries flowering, seems odd, but they do, um, but lots of asters. Oh, and a little phacelia there too. And that's all I've got. I'm hoping I wasn't watching the time. I just haven't gone over. Um, I stole one of Catherine's acknowledgement slides. So just to let you know that it's, it's been a whole team effort. I haven't included all of our research, just kind of touched on, on bits and pieces here, but it's, it's been fun. Awesome. Thank you very much, Nancy, for that excellent presentation. Um, I'm just going to share my screen here. Do I need to stop sharing? Uh, nope, I don't think so. Okay, we'd like to open the floor now for the Q&A session. Um, you can type your questions into the Q&A panel, or if you'd like to verbally ask a question, let us know and uh, we can uh, request to, um, to unmute yourself. So at this time, I'll hand that over to Brittany. I think you've been keeping an eye on some of the questions coming in. Yeah, so we have our first question. Um, somebody's wondering if uh, the pollinator mix that you've been working on is available to buy anywhere. I see Andrew have his name. Um, hi, Andrew. <laughs> uh, the pollinator mix is, uh, I 
don't, I don't frankly know. I haven't looked recently. I know I always purchased it through or had it produced through um, Spear Seeds in Ontario. Um, sometimes I went through Scotian Gold to get it that way, but um, I don't think the, the version that you see there, but it can be ordered through Spear Seeds. They can, they can put it together. Um, I know a number of people have purchased it there, not just me, but others. And I think um, Braggs have purchased quite a bit last year. They planted quite a lot of area in the valley. So Spear Seeds is where I would have a custom order um, generally. Sorry, a bit rambling there. <laughs> um, so we have two questions that seem to be somewhat related. So the first one is, can honeybees and wild bees coexist? And then um, below that we have, can you contextualize the interaction between honeybees and native pollinators? The research I've read seems to indicate that pollinator services depend most on available resources and are less challenged by competitive interaction between bee species. The heavy one. Yeah, so uh, yes, they can coexist. And there's actually research that shows that honeybees there, there's some synergy, it seems, that, that honeybees work are more effective if they are in a field with a, a, a good population of bumblebees and entrenids. Um, entrenids and bumblebees buzz pollinate the flowers. And then if honeybees follow along, then the pollen is there. So that the honeybees become more effective if they're following buzz pollinators. So I believe they can coexist very well. I just don't, uh, we ha I guess we have to think that honeybees are from the Mediterranean. They're not, the European honeybees, they're not native here. The wild bees are, are native and they're well suited to our local conditions. Some of my favorite is Bombus vegans, which, uh, it's like a woodland bee can fly in cool, wet, windy conditions. So it's a it's a really rugged bee. Um, when the little sissy honeybees would not be flying then at all. Um, so I just don't. They can coexist, and I love honey. Um, I'd like to think that you could have good blueberry production without having to pay a whole bunch of money for honeybees, and I hate to think that we'd be bringing in diseases with honeybees from it, importing them when we probably don't. I got into a whole lot of trouble with um, oh, the, the blueberry company, Wyman's, Wyman's and PEI. I got into a lot of trouble. I was interviewed by CBC a few years ago, PEI radio, and Wyman's got really angry because I said they really didn't need to bring in any honeybees. And I'd actually been in discussion with them about that. <laughs> uh, and they, I thought they agreed with me. But um, anyway, there's lots of politics with honeybees too. And uh, uh, I like honey. I don't want to give up honey. But um, I don't think that we should put wild bees at risk for the sake of honeybees when it might not be required. That was really political, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, we have another question that is, what are the biggest threats facing Nova Scotia bees in egg environments, chemical inputs, diseases? Yeah, I think it's, uh, I think part of it is starvation. So um, that's why I've dedicated a whole bunch of my working career to trying to alleviate hunger in bees. So to provide them not only with lots of flowers, but with high quality food. Um, so I think that's one of the biggest risks for bees is not having enough to eat. And if we think about the blueberry uh, production systems, it's feast or famine really. So one year you have blueberry flowers and the next year you don't. Um, so. I've been trying to promote allowing or promoting other plants to grow alongside the edges of blueberry fields or between fields um, to provide enough food, chemicals. And if you, if you do that, then you also provide a refuge 
a refuge to bees so that bees can be somewhere uh, they're not forced to be on the field during, during sprays. Although there are um, andrenids that actually nest right in the soil within blueberry fields, but it's believed that the timing is such that blueberries are not usually sprayed when the flowers, when they're blooming. So um, yeah, but a long, long way of saying, I think their greatest risk is starvation. Um, we have a question asking for tips on creating a small wildflower meadow from scratch, i.e. starting with an overgrown area or lawn. Um, there's, there's so many ways that you can support bees. I'm a little bit obsessive compulsive with plants, so I grow all kinds of things. But there are so many things that you can do. I think you should plant linden trees and you should plant, oh, there's a yellow flowering shrub that's, uh, oh, starts with a C. There's a, it's used in windbreaks too. It's, it's a, a legume shrub, grows well in Canada. Um, I think just plant, okay, the, the easiest, the simplest thing to do, let white clover grow in your lawn. There you go. So white clover, it's a perennial legume. It has really high protein. It's a small flower. Um, so the small bees and the big bees can use it equally. So the very best, biggest bang for your buck would probably be to let white clover grow in your lawn. If you wanted to establish a wildflower garden, what is a wildflower garden in Nova Scotia? Nova Scotia is native forest. <laughs> so there are very few. <laughs> flowers that are wild to Nova Scotia. Um, but, but North American wildflowers, there's all kinds of them. And um, I, I think, yeah, just go for it. There's just too many options, frankly. I like the shrubs. Oh, spireas. Uh, grow some raspberries, blackberries. Those are excellent rose. Those are rose families. So anything in the rose family, there's so many options there. Apples, cherries. Uh, service berries. Um, there's just so much. Um, we have a question asking, if I wanted to plant a pollinator patch of wildflowers, is it better to buy a commercial pack or to make a custom pack with the species you mentioned? And do you have any comment on including milkweed in this patch to help monarchs? Um, I grow my, I grow Hi, Colin. I, black locust, that wasn't the one I was thinking of, but black locust is a, a legume and so is honey locust. Black locust is kind of brittle. I've had a nice black locust, but it broke in a windstorm. Anyway, caragana. Caragana is the one that I was thinking of. It's a beautiful shrub, legume shrub. Uh, did we get off the topic? Sorry, Brittany. <laughs> um, Wildflowers, should I buy a package of wild? I didn't have any luck with them. Um, although at Bill Davison's farm, Bill and Christine, we planted some of the Syngenta wildflower mix and apparently now there are Rudbeckia growing all over the place, unfortunately. So some of those are weedy. So in an agricultural system, I wouldn't want um, to get into weed situations. But frankly, if it's just a small patch, you're planting in your yard. Um, I, I, don't, I don't like those mixes. I haven't had good luck with them. I grow annual mixes from Vessies every year just because they're pretty, but um, if you wanna do something nice for the bees, then I would not, to do the very best, I would not grow a wildflower mix for bees, no grow wildfire mixes for other purposes. But if you wanna do something for bees, I would grow something that is going to provide them with better nutrition. The problem with growing plants that have low protein is that the larvae, the larval, the baby bees don't develop well. You don't get healthy developed adults uh, at the end of their um, incubation, yeah. And then do you have any thoughts on including um, milkweed into that mix? Thanks for bringing me back to milkweed. I love milkweed. Um, ooh, one of them's weedy and one of them's not. 
I, I grow milkweed on my property to feed the um, to feed the monarchs. Um, I just grow it to feed the monarchs. Don't grow it really necessarily to feed the bees. <laughs> Choose, I guess, what you want to support and grow all kinds of plants and support all kinds of uh, insects. Um, we have a question that's asking what you think about the use of wildflower mixes for roadsides versus grasses. Um, he's, they say, I'm thinking more in the line of creating a degree of continuity in <laughs> populations and potentially broader distributions. I think that the old highway mix in Nova Scotia was fabulous. If you look, um, it had birds with trefoil in it, which was fantastic. And I think uh, just like my mix, I think there should be a grass mix in to hold the soil in place. I really think legumes should always be grown with a grass or two. Um, so yeah, I think the highway mix that Nova Scotia has used um, for a long time was excellent. So those birds switch trefoil, alcide clover, red clover, um, the vetches, a timothy or meadow fescue, I think fabulous. That's what I would use rather than a wildflower mix. Um, other than the herbaceous plants that you mentioned, what three shrub varieties would you recommend to include in restoration projects to provide benefits to bees? And the example is willows, question <laughs> mark. Yeah, willows are good. Um, three, so restoration, you normally want wild uh, species and we do have wild shrubs. Um, the anything in the rose family, um, would be good as well, um, restoration projects. So on my property, I have all kinds of wild, not wild, um, apples growing wild from seed that if we're there at an, on an old home homestead and also um, hawthorns. Hawthorns also provide really good food for bees, brambles, Three, just one at three shrubs. The caragana I would grow uh, if you're interested in, in the beauty of it. Um, uh, spireas, fantastic. Bees love spireas, um, they're native. Did I get to three yet? Oh. <laughs> Maybe. I think you did great. <laughs> um, we have a question of, are there any indigenously culturally anchored plants? Uh, you could refer to as especially vibrant pollinator forage. And there's examples, but I don't know if I can read them. <laughs> Apios americana is an example. Apios, is that the ground potato, the Indian ground potato? I I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, Apios, I think Apios, I think Ed Metanel worked on that uh, fourth year project. Um, ground potato or something. Uh, so you want, so you gave an example. Yes, yeah, so the question was, are there any indigenous, indigenously indigenous. culturally anchored plants? Culturally anchored. That oh, would be very good so for indigenous. Right, the, the problem is the, I would say the, the brambles, frankly. So the berry plants. They're, they're all excellent because they're members of the rose family and they've been, been, been important in indigenous culture um, for sure. The willows uh, also. Um, and thinking again, most plants important for indigenous Nova Scotia or Canadians, Mi'kmaq would have been trees, but brambles for sure. Another. Um, we have a question about um, seed mixes for orchards and areas that are certified organic. Are these mixes allowable in certified organic areas? Certainly. Mm -hmm. And they, the, they also don't need nitrogen fertilizers, so they're easy to grow organically. And they establish well, so they, there's not a problem with weeds generally when they're established. And there's one last question here. It says, how can we promote wild bee health while utilizing the honeybees in agriculture? I think if we grow enough quality food for both wild and honeybees, then we're fine.
There is one last question that just came in. It says, if pollinator crops are being planted on PEI the year after potatoes, what are the risks from persistent pesticide residues still in soils? For example, um, some neonicotinoids, neonicotinoids are quite persistent in soils and their levels are still high even two years after they are used in potatoes. I'm also wondering if there will be any monitoring for neonics uh, or other pesticides being expressed in pollen in the pollinator plantings. I, I don't, I haven't done any research related to neonics and these plants. These plants usually when within the research, they were planted in areas along sides of fields, which were not intensively managed. They were areas with, the other thing about the mix is it's a tolerant of low pH and variable. Um, so it can be crappy land, frankly. So it can tolerate poor drainage or decent drainage and low pH and low fertility. And that was something that I was aiming for as well. So generally it's planted uh, as a refuge, as a field border to areas that have not received uh, pesticides, frankly. And in PEI, the idea was to plant it along riparian zones as well. So as a buffer between a, a potato field and a waterway before, ideally then you would have some woody material closer to the stream bank. But um, so it's well suited to, to um, take care or to be effective in a riparian zone. So rather than replace the potatoes, they would be around the potato uh, field edges um, where there'd be refuge and some safety there. Um, that's the last of the questions. So thank you for fielding all those for us. Um, okay. Thomas, do you have some slides to wrap up? Sure. Yeah, I'd like to thank everyone for, for submitting all those questions. They were definitely um, definitely uh, very pertinent and some of them are slightly challenging. So thanks, Nancy, for, for handing, handling all of those. Um, for any certified crop advisors on the call, if you have the CCA app on your phone, you can scan this QR code to record continuing education points. Um, if you do not have this app, just please send me an email and I can manually report the, uh, the points for you. So with that, I would like to thank you all for joining us here today and, and thank you, Nancy, once again for your excellent presentation. If you have additional questions that you would like to have answered, please reach out to Nancy, Brittany, or myself. If you'd like to view this presentation again, the recording will be available on the Prenia YouTube channel in the next few days or so. I would like to bring to your attention a few upcoming webinars. On March 3rd, CARP will be hosting a webinar with Dr. David Burton from Dalhousie University, who will, be, who will be discussing nitrogen management as part of a climate change solution. On April 27th, Perennia will be hosting a webinar with Mark Greenwood from Nova Scotia Environment, who will be discussing the Nova Scotia Water Withdrawal Program as it relates to on-farm irrigation. So please stay tuned for registration links for these sessions, and you can keep an eye on either the Perennia or the CARP uh, Facebook pages for those links. Following the session, we, we will be sending out an email that will include a link to the survey. Uh, a survey, sorry. We would appreciate if you could take a few minutes and uh, let us know what you thought of today's presentation. Uh, we greatly appreciate any feedback that you have. With that, I would like to thank you all once again for joining us here today, and that concludes today's webinar.